Welcome to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio, sponsored by EarthX, the world's largest environmental experience, and also sponsored by Natural Awakenings Magazine. Live your healthiest life on a healthier planet. Now here's your host, Bernice Butler. Welcome to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio today. We're now in our fifth season, and we remain just as excited as ever to help you continue to explore and understand that unbreakable relationship between your health and the health of the planet. Here we look at the hottest topics related to our environment and its sustainability and how they affect your health and wellness. Here are issues like climate change, plastic pollution, extreme weather events, and others will meet up with everyday impacts like allergies and asthma, digestive issues and gut health, cancers, lung, heart issues, and more. So listen in today as we interview experts for today's show on our series on plastic pollution. And today we're focusing in on plastic pollution solutions. Plastic pollution solutions really is a call to everyday action. Now, in the midst of our busy lives, it's very easy to overlook the seemingly distant issue of plastic pollution, dismissing it easily as a concern that doesn't directly impact us. However, it's crucial to recognize the profound implications of our collective plastic consumption on our everyday lives, our health, and the well-being of the planet that we all call home. Now, it's no secret that plastics are not ideal. In some cases, it can take up to 500 years, and that's like compared to the entire duration of the Roman Empire, and it can take that long for some plastics to break down. That the lengthy lifespan of plastic spells big problems for human health is a real issue. The everywhere marine plastic, for instance, degrades and fragments into microplastics, very, very tiny plastics that we can't even see with the human eye, and those seep into the food chain and up into our bodies and can have significant disrupting effects. Plastic pollution, though often it's out of sight, is undeniably woven into the fabric of our existence. It permeates the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the food that we consume. The consequences of our reliance on single-use plastics extend far beyond environmental degradation. They pose a direct threat to our health and the delicate balance of ecosystems worldwide. So indeed, plastic pollution may be even an existential threat. And shifting away from plastics from one area of exposure can end up actually exacerbating existing disparities. For example, let's say you don't want plastics to end up in the ocean. So then you have this great idea, you decide to dispose of them by burning them. While those fumes create types of harmful chemical exposures, such as toxic air emissions, ashes, or wastewater. So sure, some folks will have fewer microplastics in their seafood when you divert it from the oceans, but now the people living near incinerators, which are primarily low-income communities and communities of color, will then bear the brunt of that noxious witch's brew in the smoke and ashes. So the picture is pretty grim. Humans are indeed exposed to a wide variety of toxic chemicals, and according to research, health problems associated with plastics include numerous forms of cancers, neurological, reproductive, and developmental toxicity, as well as diabetes, several organ malfunctions, and it impacts our eyes and skin. And of particular note, and often underreported, or underrealized is the effects of plastic pollution on our reproductive health. So today in our show, we want to illuminate pathways to solutions. Each piece of this puzzle contributes to a broader understanding on how we as individuals can make meaningful changes in our daily lives. We want to bridge the gap between the seemingly abstract issue of plastic pollution and its very tangible impacts on our everyday lives, our everyday comings and goings. It's about understanding that the choices we make are as seemingly insignificant as they may seem, reverberate throughout the interconnected web of our environment, and ultimately they influence the quality of our lives and the life that we all experience. 
So various stakeholders, including governments, nonprofits, and businesses, are actively pursuing innovative solutions to mitigate some of our plastic pollution. One promising approach involves investing in advanced recycling technologies. And these technologies aim to break down plastic waste into its basic components, allowing for the creation of new materials without the need for more virgin plastics. Biodegradable and compostable plastics represent another avenue for reducing environmental impact. And manufacturers are continually exploring plant-based alternatives that break down more easily thereby minimizing the long-term consequences of plastic pollution and hopefully minimizing uh, some of our forever plastics. Additionally, initiatives promoting the circular economy aim to enhance the recyclability of plastic products, creating a closed-loop system where materials are reused rather than discarded and eventually minimizing some of the plastic that we require and that we use. So while current efforts do offer some hope, it's essential to reflect on past attempts to address plastic pollution that that fell short so we can learn from them. One such example is the reliance on traditional recycling methods. Despite the widespread recycling programs, a significant portion of plastic waste remains unrecycled due to the challenges such as contamination of recycling infrastructure and the limited market demand for recycled materials. So let's now get smarter. Let's unravel the impact of our choices. Let's explore some tangible solutions and empower ourselves to be conscious stewards of the world that we all inhabit. The journey toward a plastic-free future begins with each of us in our ordinary lives and the decisions we make every day. Now, this is a lot, but here today to help us explore and unpack this are three people who we know are going to make us smarter. Today, we have with us Rob Conan. Rob is the Chief Revenue Officer for Boxed Water. They are the first national company to offer a sustainable alternative to plastic water bottles. Rob is charged with expanding Boxed Water's core message and empowering consumers to make a statement that sustainability does indeed matter to them. Rob leads the brand's trial and awareness efforts, their digital opportunities, and their retail experiences. And in his prior leadership roles, Rob has worked with other lifestyle brands for companies in food, apparel, and footwear. Welcome, Rob. And did I get all of that right? Yes. Yes, you did. Thank you. And thank you for taking time to join us. Our other guest is Wynn Cogger. Wynn is also called Dr. Trash. And Wynn is a research director at the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research. He studies the sources, the transport, and the ultimate fate of plastic pollution in our environment. His science focuses on identifying solutions to plastic pollution and assessing their effectiveness. Wynn works with nonprofit groups like Let's Do It World and Algalita, and he works with government agencies like the Ocean Protection Council, and he works with academics to implement science in practice. Welcome, Wynn. Did I get all of that right? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the, the warm welcome. And thank you for Thanks making for time me. to join us again. We, we love the Moore Institute. They are indeed and long-term friends of this broadcast. And our other guest is Jackie Nunez. Jackie is Advocacy Manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition, where she runs the No Plastic Straws movement, which she founded in 2011 as a volunteer project for Save Our Shores. Welcome, Jackie. We really appreciate you making time for us. We just have one minute before we need to go to break. So I want to start on this with when. So when, what are the main sources of plastic pollution in our environment, and and how do you all track them using scientific methods? Briefly, and again, we'll reconnect with this on the other side of the break. Thank you. Yeah, so the main source of plastic in the environment is single-use plastics, and we have a bunch of different creative ways to track them in the environment. One of the exciting ways recently, uh, we started using receipts to track trash because they have uh, locations where they were created, and timestamps where they're created, and that's like really rich data on on tracking trash. Um, I can go and do a bunch of different cool. Yeah, and we will too, get but, into but more of that on the go. other yeah. side of the break by explaining to us what you mean when you say receipts. We'll be right back on the other side with Rob Koning, with Boxed Water, with Dr. Wynn Cogger, with the Moore Institute for Plastic Research, and with Jackie Nunez with the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you. 
We want to give a shout out now to our sponsors. That is Natural Awakenings, Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex Magazine, The Green Healthy and Sustainable Living Authority for the DFW Metroplex and North Texas communities. Print issues of Natural Awakenings can be found in all HEB stores, all natural grocers, central markets, sunflower shops, and many, many other locations, as well as available free for download online at nadallas.com. Check them out. Our other sponsor is Lynn Dental Care, practicing dentistry for over 40 years with a holistic approach, looking at the whole body. Specializing in periodontics, Dr. Lynn is board certified by the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Check them out at lynndentalcare.com. Thank you, sponsors. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio, to today's show on Plastic Pollution Solutions, which is a call for everyday action by all of us. And we are back with Rod Conan with the Boxed Water Company, Dr. Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute for Plastic Research, and with Jackie Nunez with the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Now, before the break, Wynn had just begun to talk to us about the main sources of plastic pollution. And I also want to talk about its transport and the end point of plastic pollution in the environment. But when you said something that I want to uh, explore some more, you said you're able to track it using receipts. Help us understand what that is. That's right. So um, when you go to the store, sometimes they give you a paper receipt. That receipt often has lots of rich data on it, um, a date when the receipt was printed, a location where the receipt was generated. And that helps us figure out where that receipt entered, you know, the, the consumer um, system. And then we can, if we find it on a roadside or in a river, we can track that path that it may have taken to get there. So what is the significance of these receipts? Because I don't think most of us realize it. Well, receipts are another another form of pollution uh, that enters the environment. You know, similar to, to plastic pollution, we also have paper pollution. Um, and these receipts are given to people uh, pretty much every time you buy something. People print out a receipt, and it's kind of an unnecessary piece of material that just gets used once and often thrown into the trash or may fall out of somebody's pocket and enter the environment. So we see lots of receipts in the environment, actually. Um, But the nice thing about them is they have this rich data that helps us understand the problem a little bit better. So, Indeed. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's another dark secret about receipts. They've got some toxicity in and of themselves that we are just touching on and and balling up and reading all day, every day. That too. So, but again, continue on, if you would, tell us more about the main sources, transport, uh, and endpoint of plastic pollution in the environment. Yeah, so after uh, plastic moves around, people take it different places. They take it all sorts of places. We've seen receipts travel, you know, 100 miles across the country, um, and then they enter the environment, often at a roadside, and they might wash into a, a riverway. Um, And then the river can transport, we're actually doing a river transport study right now. Rivers can transport materials extremely quickly. A few days, they might go 50 miles and reach the ocean. And then once they get into the ocean, they can travel around the ocean. There are these circulating currents that we call gyres. um, and, And often the trash will accumulate really far away from land in the center of these gyres. Well, so you really don't, there's really not a true way to track the end point. Uh, the jars is one way because you got this big clump of plastic stuff. And I yeah. know that microplastics and nanoplastics end up in the human body. So, you know, really, if you think about it, that probably is. Could you call that an endpoint? That's definitely one, one end point that we're really concerned about. There, are, there is also most trash ends up getting um, uh, embedded in sediment, so river sediment, or beach sediment or, you know, down at the bottom of the ocean is really where a lot of stuff gets hung up for a long time. Um, and it's really scary because you don't, you don't see that, those places every day. They're really far away, hard to get to, but we know that they are getting absolutely really impacted by, by the human trash. Well, you know, it, it occurs to me as you say that, that we could just go and scrape that sediment, but then it also occurs to me, then what would we do with it? 
Yeah, and there's really important uh, ecosystems there that we don't want to disrupt. And so this scraping up the sediment would harm them, most likely. Indeed, that's why the plastic pollution uh, problem is so pervasive. I want to move to Jackie now. Jackie, can you tell us how uh, Plastic Pollution uh, Coalition encourages behavioral change among individuals to reduce their reliance on these single-use plastics? And, and then what impact is all of this having on our health? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. I mean, Plastic Pollution Coalition, our main goal is to bring awareness about the problem and calling it what it is, uh, plastic pollution. So it's really been our focus to advocate and educate and connect people around this issue. If you go to our uh, website, plasticpollutioncoalition.org, we have a, just a wealth of resources and guides. One, in, in fact, is called the Healthy Pregnancy Guide that we did with uh, Made Safe, but it's really a healthy living guide. It uh, has a lot of tips and tricks on how to be uh, plastic-free, but also toxic-free. Uh, we have webinars. Webinars have been really successful, uh, especially started strong after the pandemic and continued on. And our last one would be of interest of this uh, subject because it was in January, and the uh, name was Plastic-Free Resolutions, Protecting Your Health in 2024. It was recorded, and we actually translated it in Spanish for the first time, so it's soon to be on our webinar channel and our YouTube channel. So we have a lot of resources and features and petitions how you can take action on our on our website just alone. Back to something you mentioned also, I want to talk a little mm-hmm. bit about the impacts of plastic pollution on our health. And you, you mentioned uh, something about pregnancy, that you have some information on our webinar on that. How does... Mm-hmm plastic pollution impact pregnancy, and what are some of the other health impacts? I I like to say that plastic pollutes at every stage of its existence and affects everyone. Um, And that's why we say we've created this healthy pregnancy guide. We took a a group of women and different generations, grandmother, mom, uh, baby, and they tracked them through a, uh, I think it was like a 10-year period, and they took body burden tests. And you could see the amount of chemicals in their bodies as they go on. And they just made simple switches like don't microwave things in plastic, start store, storing your food away from plastic, um, receipts, you know, not, not handling so many receipts. Just simple things that you know, I think the, the hopeful and upshot of that is that you can uh, eliminate a lot of these chemicals um, just by conscious choices that you make every day. So those are some of the, the things that really – once we did this guide with May Safe, we realized this is just a healthy living guide. Um, and I think we're going to come up with another updated guide with more tips and tricks. But that one's been very successful. And um, it's just the basic way in which you can really eliminate plastic and plastic exposures. But we have, as plastic breaks down, it never goes away. It just becomes smaller and smaller. And I did a, a, a conference, I participated in a conference called Unwrapped a few years back with a lot of scientists that actually study the chemicals along with us activists. And it was quite interesting to, to see all the startling, you know, this data that they had on the toxicity of these mix of chemicals. And there's so many of them you can't even barely track. It's, it's amazing that we get any, any science done on, on the few. Uh, but we are really, it's like whack-a-mole trying to keep up with all all of it. And um, one of the terminologies that I've heard most recently is um, simplified science or simplified chemistry. We need to really kind of go that route with plastics and and really take it away from our our food and not have it touching our food at all anymore Um, or or our toys or our babies or anything like that, because it does get transferred on with the nanoplastics and microplastics. It has reached through the blood brain barrier. So they found it in our blood, in women's placentas, in breast milk. So it is very concerning. Indeed. One of our guests last on last week's show uh, referred to it as that we're living in a plastic soup. And I think that's yes. a, an appropriate analogy that everybody can understand how soup behaves. Well, we're, we're in a plastic soup. Jackie, you yes. mentioned earlier, you said that in some research, people took a, what you said, a body burden test? Yes, yes. So that's, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the, the, the right terminology is with that, but that's, they call it the body burden test. They, they take your blood analysis and they, they take a baseline of where you're at and then um, start seeing what chemicals and things are in your, in your body and then start to do behavior changes to see how you can minimize those chemicals. I think what I've heard so far as far as chemicals, exposures and stuff, and, and what I saw from friends of mine that have tried 
a, a friend of mine did a movie called Bag It, and he did a whole like Super Size Me episode where he went for a whole weekend microwaving his food and just doing all the bad things, eating canned food, doing all the things that they say. And he he took a baseline body burden test, and then at the end of that weekend, it was like off the scale, and he was just shocked at how much he had uh, not only ingested but absorbed into his system. Uh, but the upside of that too, it would took about two weeks for his system to kind of purge most of those chemicals. Yeah, yeah. In, in in on previous shows, we've we've had some mm-hmm. envi- folks from environmental medicine. And, and so I think yeah. we probably need to have them back to talk about that body burden test, because that seems like sure. a very important flex point to me, because here that's something that ordinary people in their everyday lives can participate in. You know, you go to an envir- someone in environmental medicine, you take that body burden test, you then uh, over the next week or so or three weeks, however long they, they tell you it needs to work. And you eliminate some things from your diet. It's kind of like when we're we're trying to see what food allergies we have, you know. But then you eliminate some things from your diet, and then you go back and take that body burden test, and it shows you somewhat uh, or indications of the impact on those things. So uh, I, I like that. I think that's probably something that uh, needs to be more out there because it's it's tangible. And I think everything we're seeing is that's what's needed with this whole plastic pollution issue is to just bring it home closer to people, get it more tangible in terms of them being able to see, feel, and know it's a problem. One thing about mm-hmm. that, though, um, so, I mean, my, my brother just said it best, too. We're going to find that plastic is the lead of our generation, right? Yep. It's this wonderful material. We put it in everything. It's in our it's in our water. It's in our food. It's in our bodies. Um, it's now in our air. I had a scientist once correct me once and say, we're going to find a sea asbestos. And uh, it's my understanding that those body burden tests are uh, quite expensive. So, you know, my, my big thing is let's just eliminate all those sources wherever we can so that we're not getting exposed to these, these chemicals and these um, micro and nanoplastics. As long as we know, we can, we can, there's enough cause for concern that we can start taking these measures. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. We'll be right back on the other side of the break with Jackie Nunez with Plastic Pollution Coalition, Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute, and Rob Koenig with Boxed Water Company. Thank you all. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio today, to our show today on plastic pollution solutions uh, and a call to everybody for everyday actions. We are back with Rob Conan with the Box Water Company, Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute, and Jackie Nunez with the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And they really are making us smarter. I want to start this segment uh, with you, Rob. Could you tell us about the main benefits of using recyclable cartons made from paper instead of plastic bottles or aluminum cans for packaging water? And what makes your carton the most sustainable on the market? I would love to tell you, and thank you, Bernice, for having us having us on and, and talking about this. I've already learned so much from Wynn and Jackie. First, let's just talk about what sustainability is. So making a carton, well, I mean, let me even back up. The name of our company is Boxed Water is Better. I, I think it's important to point out that we're, we're better than aluminum, we're better than plastic. We're not better than just a reusable glass of water. So, so we humbly say we, we would love to be out of business in, in 10 years, but, but right now there's over 70 billion bottles being made just in the United States, a million bottles a minute worldwide, and less than, less than 12% are actually being recycled at this point. So there's a huge, and I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, that there's a huge problem with on-the-go water. Would you just repeat those statistics once more? I want to make sure that our listeners really got it. Sure. There's uh, over 70 billion bottles being made just in the United States alone. And worldwide, there's a million bottles a minute being made. And less than 20% of them are actually being recycled. So 80% of them are going into either landfills or the ocean and or being burned, which is, as you pointed out at the beginning, which is just terrible for the environment. And so you, you pointed out, and I say the same thing, it, it goes into the oceans, it becomes these gyres. One thing that people don't think about in, in, the, in the 500 years that it's being broken down, 
It also starts to resemble um, seafood. It starts to look like jellyfish and whatnot, and all these fish are, are eating it, thinking that it's food, and they're all starving to death because they're eating plastic pollution. And that also is getting into our food, which is another way that it comes into our bodies. So enormous, enormous problem with plastic pollution. The other thing I always point out, too, is that if you read the um, – the uh, the financials of of these plastic companies they're expecting plastic production to quadruple in the next in the next five years so that they're looking at us and saying yeah we don't believe what you're saying there's there's going to be more demand than ever coming up so box oh my that's great distressing al- well there is hope <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be here okay. so, so um, box water is an alternative to plastic water bottles and aluminum cans. Um, it's made uh, primarily from paper. There is a thin layer of, of aluminum, thinner than a human hair, as well as a plastic cap. And I'll talk about that in a second because it is a bio-based plastic cap. But starting as why, why are we better, I mean, to me, it starts with the word sustainability. So you can plant trees, which is the definition of sustainability. You can give back to the planet and plant more trees. You can't put oil back in the ground. You can't put bauxite, which is what aluminum is made from, back in the ground. So you are you are literally sucking up resources uh, to make something that takes about 12 minutes to consume on average, a, a, a bottle of water. So that math just doesn't make any sense to us. Um, so the carton itself is 100% recyclable. Uh, it's made. It's 92% made from renewable materials, which is which is paper, trees. Um, is BPA free? So going back to plastic has in order to make one of the one of the chemicals that's used to to make plastic pliable is called BPA, um, and that also has many harmful effects uh, on your body, especially the endocrine system. Um, and we have the creation of our product is foldable as opposed to blow molding, um, and as a result, we have a 36% lower carbon footprint in the actual creation. And then if you look at other climate impacts, we have a 95% lower uh, impact on ozone depletion. So the actual production of our product is much more gentle on, on the planet than, than a can or a, or a plastic bottle. And then finally, at the end, it is, it is recyclable. Um, and it also is reusable. I mean, it, it's also being in a closed loop system, now being used um, in uh, the production of wallboard for the construction of homes and universities. The University of Colorado just built a whole building to be, and used us to be LEED certified um, by using um, recycled uh, product. Um, Also, Rob, could you tell us, are there any emerging uh, innovative approaches that uh, Boxed Water is Better is is using or looking at in order Mm -hmm. to help further address uh, our plastic pollution issues. Well, yeah, <clears throat> and I'm glad you and glad you asked because one of the innovations that we just worked with with our supplier in um, uh, in Norway is the is the cap itself. So the cap itself is made from the waste from the newspaper industry. Um, so anything that has carbon in it has some sort of oil, and so trees have have oil in them, and they found an efficient way to, to extract the oil from um, from the pulp that's that's being wasted, the the side product from the newspaper industry. So now that's why we're 92% made from trees. Even the cap and then the thin plastic film is is bio based. And it took us years working with this group. A lot of companies use sugar cane as a as a base, but we're finding that sugar cane itself has been grown as a for profit. Um, component to make plastic, which we don't think makes sense. We want to make it from waste and byproducts. Um, and also sugarcane is very harmful in growing the amount of water and resources it takes to create it. So, um, so yeah, so there's always ideas that are coming through. Um, we're also working on, um, on an aluminum-free carton that we hope to come out with so that we get rid of that aspect of our, of our product. Indeed. Now, you said something, though, that I has intrigued me, and I, I, I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to jump to when. You mentioned that this company has found a way to extract mm-hmm. oil from paper? From Yeah, from, from, from the tree, from um, the waste from the newspaper industry. 
So mm. newspapers, there's use obviously use trees to make their paper, but then there's the ink, uh, yeah. just mo- mountains of of it's not pulp, it's just uh, pellets that are left over. And so this company found a way to use that and then extract oil from them. That ho- that it's phrase, cool. extract oil. <laughs> from mm-hmm. usable materials really uh, ha- has intrigued me. Thank you for that, Rod. Appreciate it. I want to go now, though, to Wynn. And can you share, Wynn, any key insights from research uh, that you are aware of or research that you all have done that highlights the impact of plastic pollution on health and well-being of, of ordinary people? We've mentioned a lot of that in our conversation uh, already today, but I- any highlights or anything new or that causes us to have great concern? And what findings, what are the primary findings that people really should be aware of? I think the new thing that recently blew up is that we started being able to detect nanoplastics in uh, single-use products. So there was a paper published a few weeks ago on nanoplastics released from uh, bottled water and a single bottle of water has, I can't remember, tens or hundreds of thousands of nanoplastic particles. Um, and that just really underscores the, the risk that people are taking from, you know, using single-use packaged water products compared to, like, tap water. Um, we've done a lot of studies in, in our lab to assess the difference between in, in microplastics amounts and bottled water versus tap water, and, you know, it's just perils in comparison. Tap water is much better for you um, in terms of plastic loading. How how did we, when, how did we get into this thing where people think (laughs) and act like bottled water, including me, (laughs) is better than tap water? How did we get to that place? Yeah, that's a really good question. I I think we've, our society just loves consumption. We love fast consumption. We want as as much resources as we can possibly use in our life. And I think that's the, that's the, the silver bullet that we need to figure out how to, how to crack um, to make a dent in this problem. Because anyway, I mean, I love the things that producers are trying, are trying out to, to figure out new products and new innovations and reducing waste. And I love all the things Rob is saying here. Um, and but at, at the end of the day, if we continue the status quo of consume, 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 can I break three pounds of waste today? You know, I, I don't really see a solution. <laughs> Indeed. There. But you know what? I, I think it's time for uh, in the plastic arena, probably time for us to start looking uh, very heavily or looking a lot or maybe doing research on if and how. A new solution or a new proposed solution could or does exacerbate existing disparities. It's like back something I mentioned earlier. Instead of putting plastic in the ocean or just throwing it out, they decide to dispose of it by incinerating. That causes a whole nother set of problems. So I think we need to kind of look at that because what you just said kind of indicated that maybe some of that's going on. However, we're going to go to break. And after that break, we're going to come back, though, and and talk with you a, a bit more about research findings when. Thank you. We'll be right back on the other side with Dr. Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute, with Rob Conan with Boxed Water is Better, and with Jackie Nunez with Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you all. We want to give a shout out now to our sponsors. That is Natural Awakenings, Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex Magazine, The Green Healthy and Sustainable Living Authority, for the DFW Metroplex and North Texas communities. Print issues of Natural Awakenings can be found in all HEB stores, all natural grocers, all central markets, sunflower shops, and many, many other locations, as well as available free for download online at nadallas.com. Check them out. Our other sponsor is Lynn Dental Care, practicing dentistry for over 40 years, non-mercury, with a holistic approach looking at the whole body. Specializing in periodontics, Dr. Lynn is board certified by the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Check them out at lynndentalcare.com. Thank you, sponsors. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio to today's show on plastic pollution solutions. 
a call to everyday action by everybody. And we are back with Rod Conan with the Boxed Water is Better Company, with Dr. Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute, and with Jackie Nunez with the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And they really are making us smarter. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, before the break, uh, we were talking with Wynn about some of your recent research that came out. And I remember it coming out, uh, and I, I, I hope that others took it as seriously, and that was with finding the uh, nanoplastic particles in the bottles of plastic water, that we went to plastic water because it was, uh, or we were told, that it was better, safer, healthier than tap water. So it looks like we need a, a campaign, Jackie, <laughs> we need a campaign from Plastic Pollution Solution, uh, a campaign uh, called Back to Tap Water, maybe. And, and with that, though, I do want to go back to Jackie. And could you tell us a little bit about the key features and provisions of the Break Free Plastic Pollution Act? And why is it important for the U.S. to a- adopt this legislation? Uh, let me just add to that last comment that you made about a campaign. We actually do have a campaign called Filter Not Bottled. Mm-hmm. And it got launched along with the um, lead pipe replacement um, order that's happening throughout the United States to make sure that, that none of that money is spent just on single-use plastic water bottles, that, that they are allowed to have a filtered water. And we're happy to say that EPA just made a ruling um, just recently to have those funds, uh, they stated it on paper, that um, to be used for filtered you know, filters instead of uh, single-use plastic water bottles, which is which is used. Water you said those containers. funds. Is that are those funds, uh, the funds from the uh, yeah, Inflation sorry. Reduction Act? No, they are actually from uh, a, an, an order from the Biden administration, um, lead copper ruling to replace uh, uh, lead pipes throughout the United States. So there's a lot of money to be had. We want to make sure that they're not going to replace one poison with another, and that also includes the pipes. You know, to keep the PVC pipes out of there, because that was just going to create a whole nother problem. And but also with the the filters, because what what people don't know when they when they replace your pipes, you're going to have to filter your water for at least six months to a year, anyways, uh, to make sure that the the whole line system is is clean. And and a lot of those filters do take out lead and a lot of the the additives that that we need to get out of that. Um, so it's filter not bottled. You can see the campaign on on our website, and um, we we are addressing that. Now, you mentioned, um, and I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but you yeah. remem- you mentioned about the legislation to remove lead pipes, uh, and you also yeah. mentioned that uh, PVC piping is not a good thing, which I've heard yeah. people say. I just heard somebody tell me the other day that PVC piping was the best thing since apple pie, and uh, he was talking about it in relationship to you, you know, some of the freezes and busted pipes that we have here in Texas. So what is the optimal? Oh, for business? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, ultimately, would be copper, which is expensive, but they also have a, a cheated, um, like stainless steel, and then I think it's like a hardened, uh, a, a carbon steel, as well. There is innovations in the piping. Um, it's costly, but it, it lasts longer and it's safer uh, for us. So that is what, and, and we're actually advocating for recycled copper as well. Indeed. So if we do have a, if, if anyone wants to take action, we do have a, a, a petition on our website, tell the EPA don't replace lead pipes with uh, plastic pollution. And you can find that on our take action page. Indeed. It re- goes back to the conversation we were having before the break in that mm-hmm. in this realm of plastic pollution yeah. and its solutions, that we have to be very careful mm-hmm. about exacerbating existing issues with our new and innovative solutions sometimes. That seems to be happening a lot in this arena. I think it really comes down to wants versus needs and this whole economy that we've built on waste of, you know, basically polluting the, pro- uh, the violent for profit and this linear economy. Um, it is not, I wouldn't even call it sustainable. I don't, I don't call it a good business model. Uh, we need to have more regenerative and um, recircular approaches to how uh, we consume our food and and even you know, use our, our, our natural spaces Let at me the ask expense you something of convenience. In terms of your advocacy and mm-hmm. activism work that, mm-hmm. that perhaps you've been exposed to, in, in terms of, yeah. like you just said, prob- the things we need to do is have more circularity in our economy and other things. In terms of things like circularity, what do you think is the best touch point or starting point for that? Who should, who's best to drive that for the most effectiveness? You know, institutions, government, individuals, or, or what? What do you, in your opinion, from your work? 
All of the above, but <laughs> my opinion, my work, and also the work that I do, you know, the last plastic straw, it does come down to, I mean, you, you do have to clean your own house before you can clean anyone else's, and there's a lot that you can do. It is definitely a systemic change that needs to happen, but it also starts with your own system and, and how you want to participate in the system. So uh, we can't wait around for governments to do the right thing and to get the regulations that are needed to really protect us um, with knowledge is power, and the more that we can support uh, get active in our own communities and support these these regulations. It's it's needed. I mean, our landfills are overflowing. We're taxed by this burden. Um, I just want to re- remind the listeners that uh, the feedstock for plastic is the toxic waste byproduct of the fossil fuel and gas industry. You know, 99 percent of of plastics been made from uh, fossil fuels, pe- petrochemicals from oil and gas. So think about that for one second. They've created a market which is plastic. And they've transferred their toxic waste to us in our communities. And um, we are dealing with it in, in our communities, in our environment, in our bodies, and with no expense to these companies to be able to create these markets. No, they make, but they make billions off of it. <laughs> uh, sure. uh, last thing, uh, Jackie, uh, are there mm-hmm. some specific examples you can tell us about where communities have indeed been successful in taking charge mm-hmm. of reducing uh, plastic waste? Yeah, I mean, I was very active in California because that's where I'm originally from. And uh, so I, I am really uh, familiar with a lot of our local ordinances. Um, for once, Santa Cruz, where I'm from, uh, we were one of the first ones to have a polystyrene ordinance, a foam ordinance. And so that was uh, kind of huge. And now we've got a foodware ordinance. I mean, if you think about this kind of low-hanging fruit, a lot of this foodware and containers, if we can eliminate that with the packaging and stuff, that's kind of huge. I mean, just like Wynn said, I mean, what we're finding in the ocean is over 80% is land-based, and a lot of it is a single-use products that we actually have replacements for. And it's not even replacing one single-use product with another. It's a lot of reuse refill systems. We have case studies uh, pre-1950s these systems working, like bottle bills, you know, take back programs where you have deposit systems with bottles and and refills. And Coca-Cola was a a great example um, as far as uh, refillable bottles for uh, glass, but also a great uh, example of just the amount of waste uh, that they produce now with the single-use plastic water bottles. I Indeed, and um, I remember that way back when I was a little girl with a nickel for a bottle. So let me ask you this. Cost-wise, why can't we do that? Because I think people would move for, you know, to get money back when they turn when they turn in their glass bottles. Sure. What is the challenge with, with going back to that? The challenge is the beverage industry is one of the biggest lobbyists up against these kind of things because this is their bottom line that we're, we're changing. Um, but there's some great examples, especially out of Oregon, of businesses just getting together and doing it themselves, like a, a string of breweries that have uh, just standardized their bottles. And they share them and they, they return them back and they sterilize them, put their labels on them and it goes back out in the community. It's kind of, it's way, it's the way that we should be living. Um, the, the money stays local. I do think a lot of our answers to a lot of our problems are going to be um, local and regional. That is how we live. I mean, we have a whole local board movement where you, you source your food a hundred mile radius. Your food indeed, is fresher, higher indeed. nutritional content. The money stays local. You're right. creating jobs. Indeed. It's a win-win. It's all. It's not a win for the polluters, the people who have made the profit margin doing this. But mm-hmm. I also feel that it's not a matter of if, it's when. These changes need to happen because it's not even, a, like I said before, it's not a good business plan. You Indeed. And I think, things. Jackie, that, it, it, again, it comes back to kind of the theme of our show, a call for everyday action by everybody. And I've heard that as uh, on sure. our show is related to a lot of other environmental issues, too, is that we really have to start closer to home. But thank you for that. I want to go back to Wynn for Can a minute. Can I also address the, the policy aspect? We do have policy. That, I mean, businesses won't self-regulate. So with that said, it, it is important that we do have the regulations in place and create those guardrails that are needed to protect Indeed. us. Thank you. Uh, when, uh, briefly, what are some of the solutions to plastic pollution that you've identified or assessed in your research? And how effective are they, you think, in really controlling or impacting the, the health effects? Yeah, I mean, the most effective solution to preventing any pollution is prevention. Um, so it's starting at, you know, not choosing a single-use packaged water, choosing the tap water like we mentioned earlier, and a lot of the a lot of the things that Jackie already mentioned too. 
Are you seeing any any innovative products or processes out there? Um, maybe somebody else can answer that question. Okay, let me throw that then to Rob. You mentioned some things earlier. Are there any uh, processes or products out there that others are, are working on or that are being researched that could impact the plastic pollution problem? Um, yeah, but not a lot, not enough. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, so there's, so, so like, um, so Alaska Airlines switched from plastic water to, to, to us, to carton water, mm -hmm. but it, it was fascinating to find out. They did a lot of research on discovering a, a, a substitute to their plastic cup. So now they have a paper-based cup and, and I won't go into the detail, but it is fascinating about in order to hold coffee and, and so on, it, and all the coffee cups have plastic on them. And so they found a way of, get, of getting around that. And they're working with Starbucks now so that Starbucks can switch over. So these things are, these things out are there. happening, baby steps. And, and it comes back to that they recognize that the consumer is highly aware of this. Indeed. And, and I hate to interrupt you, Rob, but we have a minute to go. And really briefly, Jackie had mentioned something. Can you really quickly yeah. tell us about your product? Well, there's lots of innovation right now. Um, we've got some coalition members doing stuff with mushrooms and algae and seaweed um, for single use. But again, it needs to be a practical application. So in general, I mean, reusable. But at least it's can. being worked on. That's that's the key. Yeah. The best solution is plastic free and made simply with one or few materials that are non-toxic, endlessly reusable, and the best options are the plainest, and you only need one. Indeed. Thank you. We have been with Rob Conan uh, with the Boxed Water is Better Company, Dr. Wynn Cogger with the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research, and Jackie Nunez uh, with the Plastic Pollution Coalition, and they really have made us smarter. Thank you all for being with us, and thank you listeners for listening in today to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio. The conversation starts here, but our goal is for it to continue in your home, in your social circles, your workplaces, at the water cooler, and even in the grocery checkout line, so that we can all work together to realize that healthy living is simply not possible without a healthy planet. Our culture is a result of a trillion tiny acts, taken by billions of people every day like yourselves. And each of those tiny acts can seem insignificant, but all of them add up, one way or the other, to the change that we each live through. This is your host, Bernice Butler. Thank you, and join us again next week for more Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio, and listen to any of our past shows on podcast wherever you get yours. Thank you.